Is it 24-7 or 724? We'll find out this week on Motoring 2007. TSN's Motoring 2007 is brought to you by Q from Quaker State. Unleash all your horses and Michelin, a better way forward. You know, when it comes to the automotive industry, these are the best and worst of times for consumers. The best because today's cars and trucks, when it comes to quality, well, that quality has vastly improved. The worst, well, maybe it's not that bad, but because there's so much good product out there, choosing a new vehicle gets tougher all the time. Well, it's not going to get any easier. Last year alone in this country, there were 45 new product launches, and they predict next year it'll be 65. And leading the pack has been Hyundai. They said two years ago they would launch a 724 campaign in which they would launch seven new cars and trucks in 24 months. Well, we've got six down, and this week we're going to check out number seven, and it could be the most important vehicle in Hyundai's lineup. It's the 2007 Elantra. The Elantra has been around since uh, 1991. Um, it sold uh, 148,000 vehicles for us and uh, has done very well. I probably guess this is probably the most important one in the lineup. It's uh, playing in the biggest segment in Canada, compact segment, and uh, toughest competition. So this is the bread and butter car of the lineup. It's 138 horsepower, two liter, uh, largest uh, vehicle in its class in interior space. It has a design that we think that stands out from the rest gives people another choice in the segment. Has some aggressive lines, but at the same time, it's pretty premium looking and most well equipped in the segment. The old Elantra actually was, has been very successful everywhere on the globe and loved by the people. And we want with this new Elantra even more successful with the design especially, because this is the one of the vehicle that we have tried to show to the people slowly our own identity. I think the deal here, Brad, is, is price. You can get this thing for just under 16 grand, and I think that's a pretty good price because you're getting, they say, a, a mid-sized car. This is not a compact, this is a mid-size. I, I might take issue with that, but nonetheless, it is quite roomy, it's very comfortable. It's not the kind of car that jumps out of you. You don't, you don't you know, start raving saying, well, this is a fabulous car. It's not like that. It's just a A to B transport, does the job, comfortable, does everything you could ask from it. If you look at the sides, on the body, you will find very flowing lines. That is a kind of the lines that you can find from our products everywhere. We won a lot of awards. I guess over the last two years, we're up to about, I think, 35 awards. But the one that uh, really hit home the most over the last little while was JD Power IQS survey. Initial quality in the uh, first six months of ownership, and uh, you know the number of problems per vehicle. So you know we, we're really proud of that. It shows that we're making headway where we ranked uh, as highest non-luxury brand um, ahead of Toyota, ahead of Honda, just behind uh, Lexus and Porsche. This is a pretty tough market because it's unglamorous. They don't make a lot of money on these models, right? Because the profit margin is quite small down here, but yet they have to make a good product. You can't fudge or cheat. You still got to make a good car, even if it doesn't cost much money. As far as I'm concerned, this is as good as anything else out there. This is like Honda, Toyota, Mazda quality car. People are starting to think of us differently. They're, they're putting us on the consideration list that they probably wouldn't have done in the past. And now we've got the models that can give them what they need. A lot of the car companies these days, it seems to me, are getting kind of cynical and you go to these presentations and it's sort of blah de blah de blah it's the same old stuff, but Hyundai has a kind of almost, I don't know, not innocence about them, but they have a real earnestness that I quite like. They really want you to like this vehicle for whatever reasons, I don't, I don't look any further than that, and it's kind of refreshing.
Mmm, smells good to me. More later on Kenzie's Corner. You know, between now and 2009, Suzuki wants to increase its annual sales volume to 20,000 units a year. Now, if it's going to reach that lofty goal, this all-new SX4 is going to play a pivotal role. The new SX4 and its five-door design takes Suzuki closer to the mainstream market than it typically strays, and for several reasons. First, the styling is perky and not as quirky as Suzuki's of yesterday, and it has the size needed to compete with its key competition. It's 4,135 millimeters long, 1755 wide, and it rides on a 2,500 millimeter wheelbase. If you like your toys and you're going to go with the SX4, pick the JLX model. That way you'll get power locks, windows and mirrors, a simple but effective set of gauges, cruise control and steering wheel mounted audio controls, a half decent audio package and as for comfort, well there's plenty of it and primarily because there's lots of bolstering in the seats which provides the desired lateral support. Now as for weaknesses, there is but one. You either need more of this chrome trim or a two-tone option, because as it stands, this black-on-black -black finish, well, it's just too dark for its own good. Power comes from a two-liter four-cylinder engine that puts 143 horsepower and 136 pound-feet of torque at the driver's disposal. It's fast enough to be fun and delivers a decent turn of speed off the line. However, at speed, it takes its own sweet time, as is demonstrated in the 80 to 120 km an hour move. At 9.3 seconds, it makes for a white knuckle run around a slower car. You know, one of the few quibbles with this new SX4 has to do with the transmissions offered. In the case of the five-speed manual, it needs a six gear. That would make it less busy on the highway. In the case of the four-speed automatic, it needs a shorter first gear. That would give this car a better launch off the line. Minor quibbles, but quibbles nonetheless. As for ride, the SX4 is comfortably compliant and the handling quite sharp. When pressed through the pylons, the suspension takes a predictable set and rides out the run with little drama. It also has decent lateral grip thanks to the JLX's oversized P205 60R16 tyres. The steering and brakes follow this lead. The former has a connected feel, good straight line stability and a reassuring response when turned off centre, while the brakes boast a crisp pedal feel and the advantages of a decent anti-lock system. The back end of this SX4 has been well thought through for the most part. To begin with, a rear wash wiper, which means on a day like today you can actually see through the rear view mirror. Pop the tailgate and you'll find a privacy cover which keeps prying eyes off your valuables and with the seats in the upright position, nine and a half cubic feet of storage space. Fold the rear seat forward and you open up 22 feet of cargo capacity that's easily loaded. The drawback, well from the floor to this liftover is quite a high liftover so when you're lifting a heavy object out, it tends to give you a pain in the lower back. The optional all-wheel drive system features an electronically controlled clutch that can send up to 50% of the power to the rear wheels on an as-needed basis. The three-mode system allows the driver to shift between two and automatic all-wheel drive on the fly. There's also a lock position for those times when the auto system is out of its depth. It works well and is proactive in its action. By monitoring throttle input, it recognizes when the driver is about to boot it off the line. Rather than wait for the inevitable wheel spin, it automatically locks the coupling, splitting the power evenly. This new SX4 is going to go a long way in achieving Suzuki's lofty goal of selling 20,000 units by 2009. The bottom line, it's fun to drive and it's got the hatchback versatility this segment demands. If you add the optional all-wheel drive system, well that gives it another leg up because that's a feature the competition do not offer.
In the final analysis, you know, there's very little to dislike about this Suzuki Grand Vitara. To begin with, as the weather got worse, the all-wheel drive system came into its own. It'll accommodate a family of five very nicely, and it handles exceptionally well considering it's an SUV. However, three months with this vehicle taught me two things. First of all, the tailgate is hinged on the wrong side of the vehicle. That means if you've got a big heavy box to get out of here, you've got a needless walk around the tailgate. Now that speaks to the fact that this car was designed in Japan for Japan where they drive on the other side of the road. It should be mounted on this side of the road for North America. The other thing, the fuel tank is just too small in this vehicle. Now whilst we did get reasonably good gas mileage over the three month period, it still meant far too many stops. We've invited the media and some local politicians out to test drive some of our new fire trucks so that uh, we can introduce people to the new technology and the safety features of uh, new fire apparatus. We're also the first fire service or emergency service that we are aware of in North America that has introduced hybrid vehicles into the response fleet. So we have uh, Toyota Highlanders which won a competitive bid and they're now on the road as emergency response cars for our chief officers. They're performing as well as any of the police package vehicles did in the past, but they're giving us fuel economy of anywhere between 8.5 and 9.1 litres per 100 kilometres and a reduced emissions of about 70%. These are custom fire apparatus uh, designed by staff here at Toronto Fire with the manufacturers. There are safety features on these vehicles that you won't find uh, on other apparatus anywhere in the world. And there are safety features on these trucks that our staff have helped to design and develop that are now being implemented across the country. The average pumper will vary anywhere from $350,000 to $450,000 depending on the features in the pump. ABS brakes, we cryogenically freeze our brake parts to reduce brake fade. Uh, aluminum wheels now, which uh, are actually help to dissipate heat better and reduce brake fade on uh, heavy stopping, which is what these vehicles do. Accelerate hard, brake hard. They carry more water than ever before, up from 200 gallons to 500 gallons. Uh, pump capacity has gone from 2,500 to 3,000 litres a minute to 6,000 litres a minute. Uh, we can feed more firefighter hand lines than ever before. One truck can do the work of almost two. We want people to experience some of the, the features of them. We've shortened the wheelbase down that one of our trucks will actually do a U-turn on Young Street. And uh, you know that's something that was just developed here in Toronto. Shorten the wheelbase down as much as you can to make while maintaining the safety and integrity of the vehicle so that we can turn them on the tight streets. Some of the driving on the road, uh, people moving out of the way. That's, that's basically one of our major problems. Uh, they're not sure of the rules, some of them move to the right, some of them just stand still. It's just, uh, it's one of those things that should be worked on in, uh, in driver's training. Slow down and move to the right, even if you're on the oncoming traffic, give us a little bit of room because if the people on our side don't move over, you give us a little bit extra space to get through, make it a little quicker for us to get there. Just give a little blast like that, with the siren going at the same time, that usually uh, lets them know that They've got their music too loud and they should be pulling over. You know, the new 2007 Hyundai Elantra is a good subject to talk about car lighting. I've said before that if you're going to test drive a vehicle, it's a good idea to get some seat time at night so you can check out the interior lighting because a car takes on a different personality at night. It's one you may like or dislike. As for the Elantra, I love the instrument lighting. I think it gives the car a little bit more class. Now, as for the exterior, I know Jim Kenzie and I rant about this all the time, but red means stop, yellow means caution, and all lights, and I'm the last guy to talk about regulating things, but all vehicle turn signals should be yellow. Now, last year's Elantra was yellow. This year's Elantra is red, and believe me, this company is not alone. Toyota's the same way, they're all the same, they change depending on how much money, I guess, they've got in the bank. But this is an active safety issue, and if all lights were yellow for turning, like emergency vehicles, we could prevent a lot of car accidents. Anyway, got that one off my chest. Let's head to the Quaker State Garage and join Bill Gardner.
Brad, I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, think about it. Do we really take road safety seriously when something as obvious as that isn't mandated or legislated by the government? You know, people still driving around using cell phones. We don't take it seriously, do we? Anyhow, different subject. What I want to talk about this week is one of my customers' vehicles. It's a 98 Dodge minivan. I mean, there's a million of these on the road, and I've worked on a million of them. So you kind of get to know all the typical Dodge minivan problems that they're likely to have. My customer phones me the other day. I was out of town for a few days and a lot of messages on my machine from him. He couldn't get this thing started and prior to the no start situation he had all kinds of bizarre electrical things happening on this vehicle. Now he's no quitter. This guy was in the Korean War in the Canadian Forces. He doesn't give up easily on anything. So he takes the battery out himself, goes down to Canadian Tire, gets it tested, tests okay, puts it back in, he cleans the battery cables, still won't start. He tries boosting it, tries all kinds of things, still won't go. I get another phone call and I end up down there and when he lays out all these symptoms to me, I know they don't fit the Dodge minivan, so I'm looking for something else. Well, one of the first things we noticed was as soon as you hook the battery cable up, this siren under the hood started just given us the threshold of pain test. You couldn't stand the noise from this thing and uh, any mechanics that are watching this show can identify with this. It is just terrible because these things are hidden under the hood. You don't see them. You take that battery cable off and the next time you put it back on and reconnect it, it thinks you're a thief and it turns on the alarm system. And Now this vehicle had an aftermarket alarm system and therein lies the problem that we had with the vehicle and why we had the no start situation. So Next thing was to jumper the starter motor and get it running, get it back to the shop, limp it back to the shop, but it would not start from the ignition key. And we had uh, parking lights flashing, we had a, a code flashing on the dash, on the pilot light, all kinds of bizarre things that had happened in the previous two weeks to this failure, uh, all regarding the electrical system. And when I got underneath the dash, I found this garbage, this aftermarket garbage that somebody had plumbed into the vehicle and this was responsible for all the problems that he had with the vehicle. So as soon as we removed this and reconnected all the wires the way Chrysler had them from the factory, the vehicle worked just fine in every respect. And it made me think of my dad, you know, every uh, winter I would take my motorcycle down in the basement and rip it stem to stern and modify the engine and change all kinds of stuff and add accessories and invariably next spring I'd have a faster motorcycle but I'd have one major problem with something and he'd come down and say take all that garbage off that you put on there and then try it and invariably it was the stuff that I'd modified where the problem was it wasn't with the core vehicle and that was the case in this Dodge minivan so if you're thinking of having an alarm system put on or a remote start system think again boys because you're going to get a hack job done on your wiring system, a bunch of Taiwanese garbage shoved under the dash. The only person it's going to defeat is you when it's real cold or wet or you're stuck somewhere and you wish you'd never seen this garbage. Till next week, I'm Bill Gardner for Motoring 2007. Rollover crashes themselves represent less than 3% of all crashes, but more than 40% of fatal injuries are associated with rollovers. I got an email just today from a guy saying, how dare you promote the car industry? He was an environmentalist. Well, first of all, we don't promote the car industry. We report on the car industry. Why? Let me count the ways. Number one, it's our job. Number two, it's by far the most important industry in the entire country, responsible for one job in six. Yeah, there's some challenges with the car industry, environmental safety and whatnot. But I got to tell you, if you're an environmentalist, you got to love the car industry. No industry's done more to reduce its impact on the environment than the car business. The plants are cleaner, the cars are so clean that the air coming out the tailpipe is cleaner than the air going in. Now, yes, we can do better. Maybe there should be more rapid transit, but you know, I live 50 kilometers out of town. The subway doesn't come by my house and it's never gonna. Now, maybe you are prepared to ride your bicycle in a Saskatoon February, but guess what? I'm not, and neither are millions of other Canadians. It's a lifestyle that we have chosen. Yes, it is a democracy. Now, if you want to go back to a pre-industrial revolution life, well, marshal your forces and vote it in at the next election. 
It might be easier if you really want to live in a cave, though, to move to Afghanistan and join the Taliban. Now, back in the 1800s, there was one volcanic eruption that caused winter around the world for two years. Well, there's another volcanic eruption happening in that part of the world. It's called China. They are going to industrialize, and most of the energy they have is in the form of soft coal. Now, if they burn their coal the way we burned our coal, what we do over here won't matter a tiny little bit. So if you're really concerned about the environment, don't talk to me about the car industry. Go over and talk to the Chinese. I'm Jim Kim. So the question is, is the 2007 Hyundai Elantra an improvement over its predecessor? Without a doubt. I think it looks better. It certainly drives better. Lots of torque in that 138 horsepower engine, and it's very comfortable inside. Now, as I've said before, the motoring gang is kind of partial to Elantras. I mean, the man behind the camera is Dan Bailey. And Dan, how many do you have? Two. Even I can count. And the two different generations. Pete McCallum, another shooter, he also has one and the boys have no complaints. But Dan is driving a GT. It's the five-door hatchback. I've always loved the design, very sporty. So the pet peeve with the new one is, Hyundai has no plans as of right now to introduce a GT with the hatchback, which I think is kind of disappointing. Anyway, Graham will have a much closer look at the new Elantra on a future test drive. Make sure you join us for that as we continue to bring you more stories about cars and the people who drive them. Because that's really how many people still feel about Volvo, you know, as, as a Swedish, you know, environmentally friendly, safe uh, product. And I think that, you know, they've spent a lot of time, that, uh, you know, retaining the safety, but also adding performance. So now the performance is there, but, you know, there are a lot of people that build good, safe, high performing cars. TSN's Motoring 2007 has been brought to you by Q from Quaker State. Unleash all your horses. And Michelin, a better way forward.